Hello, I'm Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the C.S. Lewis Institute event titled, How to Have Panic-Free Conversations with Others About Jesus, with Dr. Andy Bannister. For those not familiar with the C.S. Lewis Institute, CSLI was founded 47 years ago as a servant ministry to the church for the purpose of helping develop disciples of Jesus Christ who will articulate, defend, share, and live their faith in personal and public life. Our Heart and Mind Discipleship Ministry now has 17 locations in the United States, Canada, and Northern Ireland, and people around the world download and use the small group resources, articles, audio and video materials, and podcasts available through our award-winning website. Thousands of men and women have also participated in our year-long tuition-free C.S. Lewis Fellows program. The program equips people to be competent and confident in their faith in Jesus Christ, so they can become multipliers for the faith, making disciples through their work, church, and family life. For more information on any CSLI programs, I encourage you to go to our website and also subscribe to receive our free digital discipleship resources and announcements about upcoming CSLI events like this one by going to Get Updates under the About tab on our website. I'd also like to invite you to join us this upcoming Advent season as we draw upon the music and biblical lyrics of Handel's Messiah through our new CSLI Advent devotional. Each daily devotion will include a biblical text drawn directly from Messiah, a daily devotional, a colorful image for reflection, and a portion of the music of Handel's Messiah all of which can be experienced right in your email inbox. Describe at no charge. Go to the link found in the chat room of this broadcast. Now would you please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this evening to speak with Dr. Andy Bannister. And we pray that you would guide and direct our discussion. Help us, Lord, to be able to learn how to have panic-free discussions about you with others and to be able to share the good news of Jesus uh, with our neighbors, our friends, and colleagues. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Andy Bannister. Andy is the director of SOLAS, an apologetics ministry which helps others communicate the gospel. He speaks and teaches widely throughout the UK, Europe, Canada, Australia, and the US. From universities to churches, business forums to TV and radio, Andy regularly addresses audiences of both Christians and those of all faiths and none on issues relating to faith, culture, politics and society. Andy holds a PhD in Islamic studies and is the author of numerous books, including his latest, How to Talk About Jesus Without Looking Like an Idiot, a panic-free guide to having natural conversations about your faith. Andy, thank you so much for joining us as we dive into this topic of sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with others. Well, Joel, thank you for having me. It's uh, always a pleasure. I've done many things with C.S. Lewis Institute over the years. Always a pleasure to do things in person or online. So thank you for having me on the on the webinar. Uh, well, uh, Andy, it's a special treat for me to be able to interview you. As a, I was privileged to have your wife, Astrid, as a student many years ago at uh, European Bible Institute. Uh, and it's been fun over the years uh, getting to know you. And I know many of uh, my colleagues at the Institute have really appreciated you over the years. Uh, before we jump into our topic today, I was wondering if you might share a little bit about your own journey and how you began writing and thinking about how to share the gospel in today's world. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Joel. So my, my backstory is I was I had the privilege of being raised in a in a Christian home, was brought up in a good Baptist family uh, in the UK in the 1970s and early 80s. And of course, you don't need to be a Baptist to go to heaven, but why take chances? That was always our family motto. And so, no, love church as a as a as a young person. But round about the sort of my mid teens, I really began figuring out that the faith that I was sort of involved in was really my mum and dad's faith. I was, as it were, holding on to their coattails, and really realized, beginning to realize that I had to respond personally to, to God's call on my life. And so I got involved in a really wonderful youth ministry over here. And it was at a youth camp on a dark and stormy night on the cliffs above the south of the English Channel uh, with the wind battering the tent that the youth leader preached this sermon that really engaged me uh, personally for the first time, went forward, gave my life to Christ. Um, but Joel, very quickly, I think as an older teenager, began realizing, do you know what? Not everyone believed that I believed. <laughs> The school I was in, we had people of all faiths and none. I had atheist friends, Muslim friends, Hindu friends. And I suddenly began realizing, man, there are some big questions i got to think around around my faith. I mean, around cultural issues and then how, you know, what, what's unique about Jesus? Why be a Christian as opposed to other things? 
And so that was really where the journey to, to faith and questions uh, began. Discovered C.S. Lewis, of course, as many of us do, as a, as a, in my early 20s, and, and fell in love with Lewis. Um, and that helped me in my journey too. But the big thing was Muslims. You see, in my mid-20s, I got involved with a group of friends who were going up to a place in London called Speaker's Corner. That's part of one of our big parks in London, where on an afternoon you can stand on a ladder or a box, you could talk about anything, get a crowd. Uh, jokes. The joke is it's the kind of world centre of free speech. And one of my friends was leading a ministry there, reaching out to Muslims, because Muslims were going to Speaker's Corner to preach Islam. So I got involved in street preaching uh, uh, to, to Muslims, and I found my new Muslim friends there, asking me loads of questions about my faith I had got never heard before. I had no idea how to answer. So I began reading and digging deeper to get answers to their questions. And over that sort of few months journey of going to Speaker's Corner most weekends and doing street evangelism, God did a, quite a work in me, really. He helped me fall in love with, with Muslims and sharing my faith with them. I still find you know engaging Muslims one of the most exciting things I can do uh, as a Christian. I love their passion, their, their energy. Um, I fell in love with public proclamation of the gospel. And I also discovered, Joel, I had a slight academic turn. I was 28 at this point, hadn't been to university. My, no one in my family had been to university. We weren't that kind of family, um, kind of really working class background. And uh, and so in my late 20s, went off to Bible college. And uh, what became a degree, what started as a degree went on and eventually became a PhD in Islamic studies. And that was the way that God brought me into the ministry I now do of evangelism and uh, and what we would call apologetics and also helping equip Christians how to do those things too. Well, uh, thank you for sh sharing that uh, little backstory to your own life. It's amazing how God guided and directed you and, and uh, it brought to you where you are today. Uh, the title of your new book, um, it's a great title, How to Talk About Jesus Without Looking Like an Idiot. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> um, hey, what, what led you to come up with this title um, from your own experience and, and others? How, how did you come up with this one? <laughs> well, the, the, the experience that led me to do it was... Um, I'm very struck by the fact that I, you know, I teach and train people in evangelism, and it's very easy for people to look at the people like myself or, or yourself, and people might look at us, Joel, and go, well, it's easy for you guys. You're in full-time ministry. You know, of course you can share your faith uh, persuasively. But actually, for me, that wasn't always the case. So before I started doing the Speaker's Corner stuff that I talked about a moment ago, in my early 20s, I was in a secular uh, job. I worked for a local hospital in London, helping them do medical conferences. And when I was at work... I was very much an undercover Christian. So outside of my job, I was very involved in my church, very active Christian. But inside that, that my first job, I remember basically I would keep my faith to myself. I wouldn't talk about Jesus. I would get very embarrassed if evangelism so opportunities arose. I would kind of tend to run away from them and feel very guilty for doing that. And looking back, basically, I was afraid. I was afraid of not knowing what to say. I was afraid of making the gospel look bad, making Jesus look bad. I was afraid of looking like an idiot. I was afraid of being asked questions I couldn't I couldn't answer because I was still wrestling through life's big questions. And so I said nothing. And I since come to realize that's incredibly common. You know, most Christians, the majority of Christians are afraid uh, when you ask them about talking about their faith at work, at school, at college, you know, with their friends, their neighbors, for all those reasons and, and more. So I really wanted to write a book that as it were, I could, if I, if it were possible to send it back through time, I would want to give to my 21 year old self and go, Andy, this is the book for, for you. And so that the book grew out of that desire, uh, Joel. And then what happened, I was teaching and training and doing you know, seminars around this area. And then I was doing one in Canada at a big missions conference. And I was on a, on a, on a zoom call with about three or four other, or the conference organizers. They, they give me this topic. I think it was something really boring. It was like how to talk about your faith in a meaningful and winsome way with friends, colleagues, and neighbors. It was so dry. And so we started batting around alternatives. And then one of the Canadians, so I, so I love the title because I didn't come up with it. One of these Canadian pastors went, Oh, blow it why don't we just call it how to talk about jesus without looking like an idiot and i was like dude that is amazing that is the title um because that is the fear so i have a canadian pastor in i think winnipeg to thank for the title um but the the, the, the topic grew out of a passion to just help christians discover natural ways to talk about our faith with our friends and our colleagues without fear Oh, that's great. But what do you think is at the root or the core of the fear that, that um, we all probably as believers have at some point? Or what, what is kind of that root base 
core reason do you think yeah. we're fearful? That's a brilliant question, Joel. And I, th- I think the answer is that there are a number of things. Um, for me, and I know for for others, I've I've talked to. Sometimes it can be um, having seen really bad examples of evangelism. So, you know, I remember as a teenager being sent out by the pastor of our church to, to, to do door to door evangelism. And it was it was hideous. I mean, it was just a disaster. Uh, you know, we got dogs set on us. Well, one occasion we had the door open by a 300 pound entirely naked man. Um, it, it went wrong in so many ways. And I think that almost traumatized me. And then I also seen people share their faith really clumsily. So bad examples of evangelism. The other problem is good examples of evangelism. I remember going and seeing Billy Graham when he came to the UK in 1989 and watching Billy do his thing, you know, preach to thousands and thousands respond. I remember coming away as a 17 year old going, my word, I I mean, I couldn't do what that guy's just done. Clearly you need to be incredibly gifted and incredibly anointed and have all this special, you know, gifting be able to be, to be evangel, to be an evangelist. It's not for an ordinary person like me. So those, those I think triggered the fear. Then I think there was the idea in my head that evangelism was all about sort of you had to master this sort of presentation, a bit like you were going door to door selling vacuum cleaners, and you had to download it onto your friend in such an articulate way that you almost sort of force them to respond. And of course, that never works in the in, in the real world. Um, so that, I think those were some of the, the fears. But the other one that I just would throw in as well, Joel, and this is an interesting one, I'm also quite conscious that our fears can reveal where our idols lie. Um, this is a more spiritually significant point for us as Christians. I think if you're afraid of something, afraid of a thing, often the fear at its root is that you're afraid of losing that thing. So if you're you know, afraid about losing your job, then your identity is probably in your work. If you're afraid about you know, uh, making ends meet financially, you might have good reasons for that, but it also may reveal that actually your standard of living has become, has become your idol. And I think sometimes for Christians, particularly in the West, we can become quite addicted to our easy, middle-class, comfortable lifestyles. If you don't talk about faith with your friends, life is easy, right? You can you can be a Christian and then compartmentalize that from the rest of your life and just get through life and everything's everything's wonderful. You have the job, the car, the 2.5 kids, a nice holiday, you know, your sports and whatever, and life is easy. And I just wonder, and I think I was guilty of this in my 20s, I wanted an easy, comfortable life. And once you start talking about your faith with your friends, it's not that it's going to become drastically difficult, but it might be a little bit more uncomfortable. You might have some conversations where people don't agree with you, uh, where people do look at you like you're a bit odd. And we are, let's remember, we're called to be fools for Christ. The Bible does say be willing to be a fool for Christ. Not an idiot. There's a difference between being an idiot and being a fool. But some of us are not even willing to be fools. And maybe actually we need to start by examining our own hearts on the journey to evangelism. Hmm. Well, that's just a powerful insight about the idea that our idols uh, can uh, be part of the issue. Uh, and, uh, I think that's an important thing for us all to reflect on it for me as well. And uh, as we look about well, what are the things that stop us from talking about Jesus, that's, that's, that's uh, really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, I know some people I know here uh, in the West as well uh, are intimidated, I think, by, by the culture, by workplace uh, laws, uh, by governments, by just the general uh, media saying we should keep our faith private, shouldn't impose your beliefs on others. But what are some ways that, you know, we as believers may take some beginning steps to kind of overcome some of those barriers? Well, one of the first things to to point out, I think it's interesting in culture. I don't know how it is in the in the in the US as a as opposed to here in the UK. We're very similar cultures in, in some ways. There are two trends I see going on in the workplace. One is that, yeah, workplaces can become increasingly political, um, increasingly, you know, places where perhaps it's frowned upon to talk about religion and, and so on and so forth. That there's that trend. On the other hand, one of the big trends in, in the workplace today, certainly in the UK and Europe, is this whole idea of bring your whole self to work. You know, so whatever your sexuality, whatever your identity, whoever you are, bring that into the workplace. And HR departments and things love this kind of stuff. <laughs> so I think as Christians, we need to we need to be to realize, well, if being if my identity is tied up with my faith and who I am. Uh, my, my Christian faith, then we shouldn't be afraid of bringing that into the workplace, but but do it in a way that's friendly and engaging and, and winsome. And sometimes if you play that kind of language, people are more open than you uh, than you realize. So, for example, here in the um, here in the UK, good story of, about this I came across recently. So there's a friend of mine who who works for uh, one of uh, works for a local government office, not that far from where I, I live here in the south of England. And he and his couple of his Christian buddies decided they wanted to see if they could start 
uh, an alpha course. Um, yeah, that's a course for discovering, exploring the Christian faith in their workplace. But to do that, they had to get it past the, the HR department. And they, with fear and trepidation, they went along to see the head of HR. But very smartly, they they used the language of equality, diversity, and inclusion. They said, we love working in this organization, which is where the EDI stuff is so, is so important to this organization. And as part of that, we thought it'd be really great if, as some of the Christians here, we started this thing called Alpha to help people think about spirituality and life's big questions and so on. The result was the head of HR went, oh, no, what a brilliant idea. That's a lovely idea. Um, the only the only condition that we would make is this can't just be open to Christians. You have to invite everybody. This is an alpha course, <laughs> which my friend Steve was like, oh, yes, we'd love to invite everybody. And then the head of, head of HR said, oh, brilliant. In fact, why don't we put an advert for you into the company wide email newsletter that goes out? So not merely did they get the thumbs up, they actually got the organization promoting it, but they'd been smart enough to use that language of equality and diversity and inclusion. And so sometimes as Christians, I think we need to just learn to play the game and the language we use. And then one other thought very quickly, Joel, in the workplace, I think sometimes there are ways of trig of showing and signal signaling that we are someone for whom faith is a, is a thing that matters. And then we can just gently wave that flag as it were, and then see whether people bite on the line i'm realizing waving flags and fish biting on lines is a mixed metaphor so i've got a friend of mine who's a who's a, who's a nurse here in the uk and i love the, uh, the phrase i learned from georgie that i like she talks about flying a faith flag so she says look whenever i she she works in a job where she's often sent to new parts of the hospital or even new hospitals she hasn't worked before the, the, the kind of nursing that she does she says whenever i walk into a new situation um i make sure that very early on i i wave a faith flag i show that i'm a christian so the way i do that is through the what you did on the weekend conversation. You know, it always comes up in workplaces, right? People say, what did you do on the weekend? And as Christians, we can sometimes duck that. I used to, when I worked for a hospital, I would talk about all the fun things I'd done on Saturday. I would talk about Sunday afternoon. I would shy away a bit from Sunday morning. But don't do that. Talk about the great fun you had playing sport on Saturday, the movie you saw Saturday night. You can say, hey, I went to church on Sunday. It was great to hang out with other people who are following Jesus, had a barbecue with friends on Sunday afternoon. You keep doing that. And you drip it in normally, you normalize faith. It's a way of signaling to your friends, your colleagues, that you're someone for whom faith matters. You haven't been weird. You haven't been strange. You've just made church part of your everyday life. And those are gentle ways of beginning to be more out there, more open about your faith in the workplace. And while you're doing that, Joel, of course, be praying that the Lord creates opportunities off the off the back of that. Don't bang your hot colleagues around the head. Cast your bread upon the waters, to use the biblical metaphor. Pray and then see how the Lord uh, brings responses your way. Well, thanks for sharing. There's some wonderful ideas and, and approaches, I think, to thinking about getting our, our ourselves out into the workplace and, and expressing our faith. I know that um, over the years, I've heard actually a false <laughs> quote attributed to St. Francis uh, to uh, preach the gospel when necessary, use words, which I know St. Francis preached more than anyone. Can you address that concept too, that uh, it's been kind of an escape mechanism, I think, for people. I don't need to talk about it just if I live it out. Any any thoughts on that in the workplace? Well, yes, I I love the fact you flagged that's a false that's a false quote <laughs> and um, it's like c.s lewis of course has many c.s lewis quotes are actually not not real ones um no francis as far as we know never never said that and and also as you say francis of cc was actually known as quite a bold evangelist he would actually walk into a lot of the sort of society parties of his day and preach the gospel to the to the rich and the influential using words um so where the people got the idea from he was just a kind of actions guy but the problem with um that approach sometimes you're right sometimes christians and i think again i think i did this when i was in the secular workplace i think my evangelism strategy if there was such a thing was i just need to be a super nice person i just need to you know wash up everybody else's coffee mugs not my own you know i need to mentor younger colleagues i need to organize the interdepartmental snakes and ladders league you know whatever it is i need to be mr nice guy and then people will go, oh, wow, look, Andy's a Christian. This is what Christians are like. Isn't Jesus wonderful? But it never happened, Joel, because I never introduced Jesus. Mm-hmm. And what happens is if you are just a nice person, your colleagues and your neighbors and your friends will simply conclude Joel is a really nice person. It's wonderful. He's my colleague. I love that he lives next door. He's such a nice chap. They will never conclude it's because you're a Christian. And ironically, what you do is all you actually do is bring attention to yourself and not to Jesus. Now, 
the the antidote to this by the way the takeaway message is not therefore go and be a jerk for jesus um <laughs> that is not what we should be doing but what we should be doing is is loving and serving and going the extra mile and then the extra extra mile with our friends and neighbors and colleagues and when people say that was so kind of you you can say thank you by the way the reason i did it is because i'm a follower of jesus and I want to show the love that I've received from him. I sometimes have opportunities to share with others. It will feel very scary doing that. Of course it will. But if you've just done something super nice for the person, uh, your colleague or your neighbor, the worst they'll go is, oh, Joel was slightly eccentric, but he did mow my lawn for me without my asking, or he did whatever it was without my asking. And you keep doing that. People are going to get the message. There is something different about Christians because of the way that you're you're carrying on. So yeah, serve people, be kind, be generous, be servant-hearted, but please make sure we tell people why we're doing it. Oh, that's, that's very powerful. I like the way that, that you're talking about just ways to naturally introduce Jesus into conversations, just talking about your weekends and being involved in the church or uh, sharing that you know you're motivated to do this because you're a follower of Jesus, and uh, I think those are really natural. Those are really great uh, ideas. Are there some other, you might say, uh, tools that we can have in our evangelism toolbox or toolkit to be able to naturally talk about our faith? Uh, yeah, I, I, there are lots, but by far the biggest one, and it's at the heart of the the book, how to talk about Jesus without looking like an idiot. The, the the key idea, the big idea at the center of that book, Joel, is that we need to learn to have more natural conversations about our faith. One of the reasons evangelism has become difficult is we've made it weird. We've removed it from everyday conversations. And if we can have natural conversations about what we believe and about why we think Jesus is the best news ever, if we do it more naturally, the conversations are going to go much, much better. And one of the best ways to have a natural conversation with someone is to learn to ask good questions. Questions are the key to good conversations. And the great thing about learning to ask questions is firstly, anyone can do it. If you are a five-year-old or a 55-year-old, you can learn to take an interest in others and to ask questions. And questions are also significant because when you read the gospels, you discover that questions are by far the thing that Jesus liked to do the most. I think someone has calculated that Jesus asks something like 307 questions in the Gospels. Um, he only answers eight directly. He was by far the bigger, a bigger asker of questions. And particularly, by the way, he often would use questions in response to questions. So somebody would come to him with a question and he would, before going for an answer, he would go, number one, he would go for the, the question. And I think we've forgotten the power of questions um in the uh, in our evangelism and so yeah that's the that's the, the big idea i would suggest now we can unpack that some more of course because because the majority of the book is around that but i'd say questions are the tool that we've been missing for many of us in our evangelism right i think that's a powerful idea i know that uh i think a lot of the evangelism training that many of us had in the past it was more about like i said a presentation we had a uh, so we had to get through these key points in order to help someone come to faith how, how do we how do we flip that and how do we become uh, a question asker? Well, how can we begin to have that mentality? What, what can we do to start that? Too? Yeah, well, a couple of things we can do, I would say straight away, Joel, actually three things. I'll be very Baptist. I'll give you three things. And if I was actually really, really Baptist, they'd all begin with the same letter. Um, first thing we can do is re read the Gospels through or perhaps just take the shortest of the Gospels. Take Mark's Gospel, just 16 chapters. You can read that through in a couple of hours and just make a note of every time that Jesus asks a, asks a question. It's a really interesting spirit, a little devotional exercise, actually, to go look at the questions that Jesus asks, because you get a masterclass right there in how to use questions. And you're, as you start underlining those or marking those in the margin of your Bible, you will see so many of them. And it can be interesting to go, OK, what were the kind of questions Jesus asked? How is he doing this? Um, in Mark's gospel is good. John chapter three and Nick with Nicodemus is a really good example of how Jesus navigates through that conversation with someone who's quite open, but not really sure what they believe. And again, it's questions that Jesus uses to, to lead Nicodemus through. So so start with the master question asker. Start start with Jesus. Um, and in fact, um, if you want to read a little bit further on, this is a wonderful book called Jesus is the Question by Martin Koppenhavra. And you can find that on uh, on anywhere where book, good books are sold. I won't. I won't. I was going to mention uh, the, the, a big bookseller beginning with A, but let's not give Jeff, Be <laughs> Jeff Bezos more money. Um, Jesus is the, is the question, and that's a brilliant look. And the one of the things I like about that book in the back, in the appendix, it's got every question that Jesus asks categorized, and it's a really interesting exercise to read through the questions Jesus. Asks. Start with Jesus. Second thing I would suggest that you can do um, 
Joel, is just practice taking an interest in people. So if you're a bit of a nervous evangelist, don't leap straight in with, right, I'm going to try and start evangelizing tomorrow. But what about taking an interest in people a bit more tomorrow? So next time you're, you know, in a coffee shop buying, you know, coffee, don't just, uh, you know, sit there on your phone while the barista's making a coffee for you. you get chatting to them. Ask them how their day is going. Ask them a bit, but, you know, find out a bit about them and their story. Um, I learned to do this when I lived in Toronto in Canada a few years ago. I used to use Uber a lot. So that was how you get around Toronto. And I set myself the task of trying every time I was in an Uber ride to find out at least two or three things about the driver. So I would, you know, you should start by saying, so how long have you been driving for Uber? And, you know, is it anything you do? And, you know, have you, have you lived in Toronto long? And all those kind of questions. And it's amazing how much better you get at asking questions and taking an interest. And by the way, when you take an interest in somebody else, they'll take an interest in you. Um, and it's much easier than to tell some of your story. But just start low key, start learning to take an interest in others. But then mm -hmm. thirdly, if you have people around you who don't who will very obviously don't share your your faith but believe in other things i mentioned muslims earlier right a lot of our big cities now have big muslim populations hindu populations you know many of us listening to this have probably got friends or your know, colleagues who don't share our christian faith but practice something else great way you could start a conversation with someone from a different faith is to say hey i forgive me for asking but you're a, you're a muslim right or you're a jew or you're a buddhist right and your friend will probably say well, yes, I am. And then you could say, that's interesting. I don't know much about Buddhism. Or I don't really know anything about Islam. Tell me, what do you guys believe? And ask lots of questions and then ask a follow-up question and a follow-up question. Take a genuine interest. And then after, you know, a wee while, you have a very natural opportunity to say, this is fascinating. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Some of the things you've described are similar i really identify with those but there's also things that you describe that, that are very different that, that we believe very differently as christians your friend will probably because you've taken an interest in them say oh such as and if they don't by the way you can simply go well for example and you can still leap in <laughs> and share what those differences are but it's gonna be a much more interesting conversation because you've found that take the time to find out about them first you know people are much more willing to listen to us if we take the time to listen to them and of course that then means you know when your friend is talking you can be praying you can be praying you know giving ask, asking the lord to give you a nudge as to where to connect into the conversation so yeah so um learn from jesus take an interest in people and then find out what people believe and use that as a starting point oh, that's, that's some great great tips i really appreciate that uh what as far as just question asking itself do you have any uh, rule of thumb or some kind of you know what how do you ask a question? You know, you know who, what, why, when, where, how? What do, what do you? How do you just even come up with the questions themselves? Yeah, well, it's funny you said who, what, why, when, how, because one of the things I do in the book there are there are four chapters in the kind of middle of the book where I actually introduce four questions, all beginning with a, uh, all beginning with W, uh, because I have a. I have two young children in the house, so we're very used to their house to short quest short sentences that begin with W and end with question marks. You know, why, what, <laughs> when, and so on. Um, so very briefly, um, you know, I introduce what I call the what uh, question. What do you mean by that? That can be useful in a conversation if someone raises more of an objection to your faith. If someone says like, oh, you're a Christian, right? Well, you know, what about science? You know, how can you be a Christian in the age of science? Rather than panic or run for the fire exit or just freeze up, a great question there is to go, oh, that's really interesting. What do you mean by that? What precisely do you mean by the idea that science has, 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 has demolished your faith in God? Or if somebody says there's no evidence that God exists, rather than, again, panic or feel you need to download a lecture onto them, simply saying, well, that's interesting. What what do you mean by the word evidence? What, what would count as evidence for you? So the what what questions can be helpful and your friend said something and you want to you want to clarify a word and by the way you can use that with with if the person hasn't raised an objection either so if your muslim friend says well of course i'm a muslim i believe in god it's quite interesting to say oh interesting what do you mean by god because different people mean different things by the word god what do you mean by the word god and that will in time open up chance for you to say what you mean so the what question the why question is when you can ask someone why they believe something um, so if someone's a Muslim, you might say, oh, that's interesting. What, why are you a Muslim? Why do, why do you believe that? You might get the, the backstory. If someone says, oh, you know, I, you raise an objection, they might say, oh, you know, I can't, how can you, how can you trust the Bible? How do you take the Bible seriously? Again, rather than panicking, you might say, interesting. Um, why is it that you think the Bible's not reliable? What is it that you've seen or read or heard that, that's led you to think as you do? So the why question is really good for digging into what another person believes. And then the third one I'll just I'll just share. And in, in the age that we live in, I think today's cultural moment, Joel, I think this is actually probably 
one of the most powerful questions we can have in our repertoire. And it's what I call the wandering question. And I think the same is true in the US, from what I understand of your cultural trends as we have over here, that you have an increasing number of people in the US and, and, and in Europe who they are not atheist, but they're not religious. They tick the no religion box on, on censuses. They say, well, I'm, you know, spiritualizing maybe, but I'm not interested in organized religion. I'm just not interested. Or they'll take, they'll really push into the not interested part. If you try and have a spiritual conversation, they won't define as atheists, but they'll simply say, I'm not interested in, in religion. Just doesn't, doesn't interest me. I've got lots of friends like this. And starting conversations with them can be quite tough. But with the wandering question, and this is very uh, C.S. Lewis, by the way, what you're going to do is you look for something in your friend's life that uh, in, as you get to know them, that listen to their conversations, you look for something they're passionate about and you gently probe and you ask about why they're passionate about that thing. Now, let me give you an example. You know, I've got a good friend of mine, one of my oldest friends, um, who for years would say he's not interested in God, doesn't interest him, doesn't see any any need for God. But he was passionate about human rights and justice. In fact, he had a little Amnesty International sticker on the back of his Honda. And um, I eventually began to start conversations by saying to John, you know, have you ever wondered why human rights matters? Why do we take justice seriously? Why do you care about human rights? I mean, if there is if there is no God, we're just atoms and particles in motion, right? But obviously you don't think that. So have you ever wondered why rights and justice and freedom matters to you? And you could do that along a whole range of topics and and interestingly of course in the case of lewis as you'll know i mean he came to faith effectively through a wandering question you know in his in his 30s really began wandering about all the things that he cared the most about music and art and literature and culture what was the source of those things beauty you know his um uh and joy his autobiography of course surprised by joy um and as lewis began asking that question i, I wonder where those things come from that's when, of course, his materialism collapses and he begins that journey through, you know, general theism at first and then into Christianity. So mm. learning to ask wandering questions, I think, can be very, very helpful in terms of starting spiritual conversations when there looks like there's nothing to work with. Yeah, I really, really like that idea. I think especially as there do seem to be, at least here in the U.S. and in the West, the nuns, people who now ad identify with no particular religion and uh, finding ways to connect. I like that. That's a wonderful uh, thought, the, the wondering questions. I think almost everyone has some kind of passion or something they're interested in and breaking that down. Well, what do we do? Uh, you know, uh, obviously, if you know, people challenge us, we can, you know, we rather than having to download the top 10 reasons why God exists, you know, come back first and ask them what they mean by God, asking these kinds of questions. But at a certain point in time, it does come back to us to answer the question. And what do we do when we're stumped by a tough question and you know we've we've kind of used questions to get them to explain but then they come back to us and say no i really want to hear you know why uh, uh why this question what do you think about this question and, and we're stumped by it or maybe don't feel like we have a good response what are some ways to handle that situation well the first thing i would say um joel is that if we genuinely have nothing you know if that we've got nothing to work with at all i think the best policy is honesty actually rather than try and muddle our way through it and make a hash of it and and look like an idiot or make christianity <laughs> look stupid there's mm -hmm. actually nothing most of the time there's nothing wrong with saying do you know what that's a really good question thank you for asking it um look leave it with me i'm a christian who likes to be thought through i i uh, you raised a great question i will go and find the answer and then be good to your word you know do an internet search read a book ask an older wiser christian um the one exception to that rule is i think there are some topics that probably every christian does need to have thought about a good example would be the suffering question if a friend asks you you know how and can you believe in a good god when there's you know evil and suffering in the world look at what's going on in the in in, in israel and gaza right now or putin and ukraine or, you know whatever um if you simply go oh what's a good question i've never thought about that uh, you don't look humble. You look like an idiot because, you know, if you're going to be a Christian in a complex, broken world, you probably need to have thought a little bit about it. So so do do some thinking around the questions that your friends raise. And of course, that's scriptural, right? First Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give a reason, to give an answer for the for the hope that you, you have. So as Christians, I think, it, it, you know, it's good to do a little bit of thinking. But look, if you get asked a question, and you've got a few ideas, but you're not sure how to organize them. And you want to avoid giving your friend a lecture or a sermon because that's never going to go well because, you know, they're not going to sit there for 15 minutes while you bang on. In the book, I teach a little five step um, 
sort of series of steps you can go through with someone when trying to answer a question. And because of my Baptist roots, I do like acronyms. So I based it around the word the word share, S H A R E. So the S of share is for sympathize. So the first thing you can do when someone asks a question is identify with the question. So if someone asks a question about suffering, um, it can be really helpful to perhaps ask why they're asking it. They're asking it because they experience suffering. Show some compassion. Say, I'm so sorry to hear that your loved one died. I, that must be really awful. I can understand why that would cause you difficulty. Perhaps you might talk about difficulty you've had with yourself with that. Of going, you know, I really thought about this question when my, my friend died in a road traffic accident. And I, I really wrestled with, you know, the mess and the brokenness of the world. So sympathize is the first thing. Make a connection with the person. Second thing, though, the H of share is hidden assumptions. Behind every question, Joel, there'll always be assumptions that the person's brought into the conversation without realising it. And, for example, on the suffering question, one of the assumptions that people bring into that question is that we can tell what's good and evil, what's right and wrong, absence of God. And again, you know, our old friend C.S. Lewis, you know, talked about this where he in his, you know, pre-Christian days, he would use those words, but never really occurred to him where the standard was that he was getting those things from. As Lewis says, you know, a man doesn't call a line crooked unless he first has some idea of what a straight line looks like. And so you can gently ask your friend, hey, you're obviously implying that suffering and evil is is wrong. Just out of interest, why do you think it's wrong? Where are you getting the standard from? Because in a godless universe, it just looks like everything's in, in, in atoms in motion. Don't try and be smug and clever and do gotchas on people, but just gently tease out that there are some hidden assumptions. Thirdly, and briefly, that the A of share would be apply the Bible. You want to try and bring your friend more into the biblical story on evil and suffering. That's the example we're using here. I might begin by saying, you know, it's interesting that one of the things I appreciate about the Bible is his honesty when it comes to evil and suffering. It doesn't try and explain it away. It doesn't try and deny it. In fact, we on the very first few pages of the Bible, the Bible is very honest that something has gone wrong with God's good creation um and of course because the bible tells a story of a god who is goodness itself the bible gives us that framework for talking about good and evil in the first place fourthly mm -hmm. penultimately the r for, of share retell the gospel don't just give abstract answers or clever bits of philosophy that you've half remembered from a c.s lewis book you read try and bring jesus into the center of your answer and again on something like suffering that's quite easy to do in one sense, because you can say, you know, what I value about the Bible, it doesn't give abstract answers to the problem of suffering, but it tells the story of what God has done in Jesus about the problem of suffering. Um, in fact, the whole of the New Testament story is really God's answer to the mm. problem of suffering. And then lastly, E of share is equip. Um, you know, be thinking about, you know, you've only got two, three minutes to talk to your friend. Is there a book? or a podcast or a something, a, a short video you've seen that you can leave them with. It can be really helpful to say to a friend, you know, we've I've only scratched the surface, but you know, I found this book, you know, really helpful. I if you if you're interested, I'll get you a copy. Or the, I saw this video online where somebody explained, you know, what we've talked about today in more in more detail. Try and leave your friend with something. Uh, and sometimes, praise the Lord, that that leaving with something might be scripture itself. There might be an opportunity to go, hey, look, you know, why don't you go and take a look at this passage of the bible um this might actually really help you with your question so s-h-a-r-e share well that's that's a, a great great help uh, andy uh, this whole idea of preparing to intentionally share our faith i think is an important one. i mean that our, our ministry the csms institute is uh, we're dedicated to hopefully uh, preparing people uh, to be able to articulate defend share and live their faith uh and uh uh, your books, uh, obviously, one again, I'm going to flash your book again just because I do encourage people to get a copy of this and some of the things that Andy is sharing as we go along, uh, you can spend more time in. But are there other, uh, if you were to recommend uh, other ways to prepare, do you, do you recommend doing it uh, like small groups with uh, uh, certain, certain ministries or certain books, certain programs, what, what, anything that stands out to you as practical ways to prepare? Yeah. In this, in this well, obviously, I would highly recommend the C.S. Lewis Institute. So, you know, if you haven't <laughs> signed up for the Fellows Program, you know, then just get on there, do it today. Um, no, the, 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 more, ser more seriously, um, I'd say a few things here, Joel. First thing is prayer. We you know we've talked about prayer a couple of times as, as, as we've gone. Praying intentionally around evangelism can be very significant. Um, you know, making a list of non-Christian friends, neighbors, colleagues, people that you see regularly and begin regularly praying for them um you know one of the things i often will say to people is look i said at the start of the you know the start of the webinar that people may look at likes of yourself and myself people who are ministering go oh it's easy for you guys you've got a platform you can talk about the gospel that's true but i'm probably i'd imagine that for you similar to for me 
it's still hard on those one-to-one conversations. I still find it as tough as the average Christian talking to my next door neighbor or my, 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 my siblings who are not followers of Christ, because those are one-to-one relationships and they can be hard to navigate praying for those people regularly. And we have found my wife, Astrid and I have found, we moved house about uh, 18 months ago into, into a new part of the country. And it's been amazing how God has answered the prayer as we've begun praying regularly for our neighbors, for the people we've met, you know, even in that short time, we've seen some real spiritual breakthroughs. You know, actually, one of our one of my wife's uh, sort of friends has now has just recently started doing the Alpha course. Uh, we've got one of the kids in the house across the street has started coming to, uh, to church with my kids. Um, amazing how God's answered those prayers. So start praying. Secondly, don't try and do evangelism on your own. It can be really helpful to have friends supporting you if you are in a workplace. Um, you know, are there other Christians in your workplace that you could be occasionally meeting with to pray together, to encourage each other? If that if that's not the case, are there Christian friends at church that you could be getting together occasionally with to talk about what's going on in your workplaces? You know, what form, why not form a little prayer triplet and, uh, at, uh, at your church with where you get together with three or four others and you start praying for your witness in your workplace, in your college, in your school, whatever. It can be really encouraging encouraging knowing there are others who are praying for you and with when things go well you can share what god has done and rejoice when things have gone badly you know you're not carrying that on your own you've got mates that you can come along commiserate with so don't try and do evangelism on your own would be the uh, the second thing and then thirdly if there are you know in your town in, in your church in you know in the networks that you're in if there are courses or programs i mean i joked about the c.s lewis fellows program it's a brilliant program joel i can say that because it's not because i'm not running it it is phenomenal <laughs> but there are other programs and courses too and if we have the time uh, available you know it's wonderful in this online connected age that we live in it's much easier to do those kind of things so if you've got a little bit of time reading a book there's my one and there's others do a course do something that equips you that little bit take our faith seriously such that we invest time into growing as disciples of christ because what i love about the c.s lewis uh, institute fellows program is you put evangelism and discipleship together they're not they're not separate sharing our faith is is part of our discipleship of, of christ as we seek to reach out we grow in faith ourselves and this is a wonderful virtuous circle that as you seek to share christ with others you grow in your and your following of christ yourself it, it's wonderful mm-hmm. no, thank you for that that's uh, that's uh helpful and i think thanks for the endorsement for the institute we appreciate that <laughs> as regards to uh uh, than actually doing evangelism and and uh, getting out and sharing our faith. You know, we can we can pray, which is very very important. We can prepare by uh, studying, uh, doing these things. But is evangelism something you really need to learn by doing? I know in sports, you know, you practice, 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 and then you have game game day, and then you're on the field playing. I guess the question is, how do we uh, practice evangelism, uh, or is it just something you just have to learn? on the field by doing any thoughts on that yeah i love the sports analogy actually because i mean i i use that a little bit in the um in the book in that i'm not a i'm not a great team sports person because i have terrible hand-eye coordination and so any ball sport i'm a disaster um but rock climbing has been a sport you know that i've enjoyed kind of over the years and what i learned early on in that was you're absolutely right you you can't learn rock climbing without going and doing rock climbing if you just sit you know in a classroom and uh, listen to electron tying knots and belaying and abseiling that's going to be no use at all it might be a little bit of use but it's not going to be a lot of use when you actually go and hit the rock climbing wall and the same i think goes from having friends who play you know soccer uh, or hockey or you know whatever is your whatever is your is your particular thing i think you do learn learn by doing so and that's very much the case i think with evangelism and i think we see that model in the gospels interestingly we have that that you know those episodes in the gospels where jesus sends out his followers he sends out the 12 in pairs he sends out the 72 notice in pairs by the way he doesn't send them out on their own he sends them out so they've got support but he does send them out uh to go and sort of try this stuff out so i think, I think we learn a little, we, we definitely learn we learn by doing um the other thing we can learn about an evangelism that we don't always do enough of joel too is i think we can also learn by reflecting so we've had conversations you know with friends or neighbors or colleagues if they've gone well um great pray over that you know pray over the conversation the seeds that you've sown thank god for the opportunity um but try and figure out why did it go well were there things that i did that worked particularly well was if my friend asked a question was there something i said that really resonated you know if you're a journal keeper make a note of that because it'd be helpful conversely if something goes bad if you have a conversation that goes a bit wrong or a bit clumsy 
don't just beat yourself up bring that before the lord and go lord i'm sorry i you know i messed that one one up and just pray for that person that you know you know god's bigger than your conversation thankfully but also again learn okay what did i what did i say was there something i did that was crass that was unhelpful so that i don't repeat the mistake and again that's how we learn and get better in any 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 pursuit you know if we're, if we're learning a sport and we make a mistake we try not to repeat it again um and so on and so forth so i think we yeah we can very very much we can learn and again once again this is also an advert for for bringing older wiser christians around us if you're a younger christian listening to this if there's someone in your church or your circle of christian friends who is just a much more natural evangelist that you look at and you think wow wish i was like them well don't just sit there think well i can't do it because i'm not like them go up to them buy them a coffee and go share some wisdom can you tell me how it is you share christ with your friends um you know if you've got someone who goes out doing evangelism go go with them at speaker's corner we're not all called to go and do do street evangelism but i learned street evangelism by going and doing it with older wiser christians it was a disaster for the first few months but i learned so much because i went with others who were older and wiser so yeah learn from learn from the older older wiser as a saints who've gone before us. Yeah, that, that's that's very helpful. Well, in our world today, I, at least in the news here in, in, the, in the West, in the U.S., we hear a lot of discouraging news about uh, about faith. Sometimes we hear that uh, a large percentage of people who used to identify as Christian no longer do. Uh, you have this large group of nuns, the people of no faith anymore in anything. Uh, but are there some encouraging trends that you could share with us that, from your perspective that you're seeing going on? Uh, in the West and even worldwide, uh, as far as the spread of the gospel and and uh, as it regards evangelism in our current culture. Well, yeah, I mean, I love that you said worldwide because I think one of the things that's really helpful for us to do, Joel, it can be very e easy for for us who are Western Christians to be a little bit sort of geographically myopic that we just focus on our own area. So, if we American Christians, we just look at America. I'm a Brit, I just look at the UK. Start by looking globally and going, what is going on with the gospel worldwide is astonishing. I mean, you look at the growth of, uh, of Christianity in, in Africa. There were 9 million Christians in 1900. It's something like 400 million Christians in Africa today. It's it's the growth is 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 incredible. Or China, you know, over 120 million Christians in China. China is on track to become the most populous Christian country sometime this century, which is mm. astonishing when you think most of that growth has been in the last few decades. Whilst and the Communist Party have done their best to destroy the church, and it hasn't mm. worked. Or you look at the fastest growing church in the world today. It's always fun to ask people, where do you think the fastest growing national church is in the UK, in the world? Most people don't get that answer. The answer is uh, it's Iran, the Iranian church, over a million Iranian Christians uh, now. So whenever we hear Iran, we tend to hear it in terms of what the politicians are doing, and all the bad stuff. But underneath the surface, it's just mm. un unbelievable how fast the church there is growing. But then we come close to home. Um, you know, here in country in places like the UK and the US, on the one hand, the sort of nominal Christianity of a generation or so ago is beginning to burn off. And yes, there are less people attending church perhaps than there were, but it's an interesting question to ask how deep that faith went. When Christianity is a cultural phenomena, a lot of people go because that's what you do culturally. One of the plus sides of where we are now in, in our cultural moment, if someone is going regularly to church in the US or the UK or Europe, you can be much more certain the faith is there. They're very serious about their faith because there are much many more options on a Sunday morning than there were. That's the first thing. <clears throat> and then secondly, it's interesting that we can sometimes look at the past through rosy colored spectacles and say, oh, wasn't it wonderful 100 years ago? Talk to people who, you know, remember that that kind of period. I don't think it was that straightforward. I don't know the, the equivalent sort of data for the for the US, but I know in the UK, if you start reading reports from, you know, churches in the end of the Victorian era, you can hear reports in the late 1800s of pastors complaining that there were th only three people in church on the Sunday morning and two of them were drunk. Um <laughs> But today we tend to think, oh, the churches were full and it was it was amazing. I think it's more complicated. And then the last thing I'd say is I think you're, you you in the US are lagging slightly behind where we are in the UK right, right now. But in the UK right now, I'd say we're in this very exciting moment where we are post-post-Christian. So a lot of the young people that I meet when I go and speak on university campuses, they're not rejecting faith. Um, they don't know anything about faith because they, they're they not Christian. Their mum and dad weren't Christian. Their grandparents weren't Christian. They know nothing. Mm. And there's a, huge, there's, a, there's a real openness there to talk about spirituality. There's sometimes some misconceptions. They've perhaps heard the word Christian, but never actually talked to a Christian. 
And I think if you can take the time to listen, ask good questions, show how Christianity really has something to say about the issues they're concerned about, justice and identity and ecology and all these things, um, you know, show people that Christianity is really, really relevant to the questions they're wrestling with. And uh, and I think amazing things can happen. And that data, interestingly, was backed up. I had a conversation a few months ago with a with a with a with a with a sort of a friend of a friend who is a, is a is a chaplain in the military here in the UK, and he made an interesting passing comment. He said, "When I try and talk to people of my age, and he's forty in his forties about faith, you get the objections: faith and science, reliability of the Bible, all the old stuff." He said, "I go ten years below that. I go to to, 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 to folks in their early thirties or their twenties." Um, he said, "There, what happens is they have no idea what Christianity is." And actually, there's a massive openness to talk mm. about things. And what excites me about that, Joel, you look at the book of Acts, the gospel took off in that kind of culture where people were spiritually open, but all over the place, where most mm. people had never heard of Christianity, they have no idea who Jesus was, and the gospel took off like wildfire. Mm. So I think what we need to be doing is perhaps rethinking some of the ways we do evangelism, making sure that we're addressing the questions that people are really asking, but mm. doing that with a confidence that that the Holy Spirit is very much on the on the move. Don't be afraid by what's going on in, in, in culture because cultural moments come and go, nations rise and go, uh, and so on and so forth. But God stands above all of those things. Uh, so I love that thought and the fact that the kind of post post Christian era, I think many of us assume a certain level of biblical knowledge or understanding of Christianity, and yet it sounds like there's this whole new group of young people yeah. really who know nothing about us. Uh, about our faith and uh, so really I'm almost a clean slate in a sense they may have some a few preconceptions but I guess that's where they're asking questions and find out what questions they're really asking and what they really know is so important so we don't assume that they already have a, a negative view they may have no view of us at all so that, that's a really encouraging uh, I think so thank you for uh, for sharing that uh, as we um, uh, then think about just the world today do you have any final recommendations for us as believers uh, and and uh, some other ways in which we can try to implement some of what we've been talking and and just some encouragement and hope that we have going into the future here as as uh, witnesses for Christ. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things that 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 Joel. Again, I'd want to just emphasize the importance of, of prayer in terms of what we can do as uh, as believers. But but praying intentionally. I don't. I never want to use just prayer as a throwaway answer. Well, we can pray. Really pray intentionally. Pray for opportunities. Pray for your friends, your neighbors, who, and colleagues who don't know Christ, and keep doing that repeatedly. Because time and time again, I have seen in my life, and I have friends who've seen in their lives, when we do that you know god opens up those opportunities as uh as the, a famous english archbishop from a few generations ago once said william temple uh famously said when i pray coincidences happen and when i don't pray they don't yeah. so so pray expectantly and then be ready to act when god does bring people across your path i think that's the that's the first thing secondly we talked about the importance of readiness make sure that we're ready because sometimes we can miss opportunities because we're, we're not prepared so you know make sure that we're we're reading the scriptures and we're, we're immersing ourselves in the in the bible so we know we, we know our story well make sure we're thinking about the questions of the current age um thirdly take an interest i think in the people that god brings uh, across our path uh, and around us but then i think the last one we touched on a moment ago don't let ourselves be discouraged and distracted by what's going on in culture i think one of the big temptations uh, there are two temptations for christians in contemporary culture i think one is to get disheartened um we can just go oh it's all you know it's all over it's all the disaster it's not like i remember when i was a child um to go well yeah you know god is bigger than all those things don't get discar discouraged but then don't get distracted particularly by culture wars um i used to say i think this is more of a temptation for american christians than british christians i think we've caught up actually um it can get very easy to spend all of our time you know wanting to fight for the christian position on transgenderism or the ecology or abortion those are not unimportant topics but if they become the main topic um we can get we can take our eye off the ball ultimately What's going to transform our nation is when more and more men and women discover a relationship with the Savior and are transformed from the, the inside out, not through just moralizing people into supporting the Christian position, because that way we make Pharisees, not disciples of, of Christ. So again, that's not me saying don't care about the topics that you're passionate to if you're listening to this, but just make sure that it's Jesus front and, and center and some of those other cultural pieces that we can sometimes get distracted with. We put mm. those in second place. Mm. 
Uh, those are great, uh, great words. I, I, the one that strikes me is just being ready. Uh, I remember not too long ago uh, uh, traveling and and being next to someone who shared about their loss, and and I did uh, uh, express my sorrow and, and sorry for all that she'd gone through. But I realized later I missed an opportunity to go a little deeper, and I think uh, the the Holy Spirit can prompt us in this. So I think being ready uh, uh, and uh, reflecting, as you mentioned, on our, our the times we've. Uh, been with people the, on the conversations we have, but then also rejoicing then in the times when we do see God at work. And it's exciting to hear all that God's doing around the world. And I know he's working uh, in all of our lives as we uh, open up to him. I know one prayer I think God will answer, and that is a prayer that the Lord would give us uh, someone to share the gospel with. I think that's a pretty good uh, prayer in God's will. So thank you so much, uh, Andy, for these uh, this, this wonderful conversation uh, today. Uh, you've really given us a lot to think about. And again, encourage all of you to, to pick up this book. Uh, it's a fantastic book in helping you uh, learn to grow uh, in your ability to share the gospel of Jesus with, with your friends and others. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. May God bless you and Astrid and your family there. Thanks again, Joel. It's been an absolute, uh, absolute privilege uh, speaking with you today. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you who uh, tuned in and uh, wa watched this uh, uh, interview. Uh, uh, our prayer is that uh, this will help you to become uh, a confident and competent to witness it for Jesus Christ in the, in the days to come. Uh, and uh, for those of you who, uh, again, don't know the CS Lewis Institute, I'd encourage you to, to, uh, to sign up to receive our emails and uh, uh, digital communications and to check out our website. Uh, uh, programs like this are made possible through the generous uh, gifts of people like yourselves. And so if you'd like to prayerfully consider making a gift, we'd like to ask you to do that. And uh, uh, we are just so grateful for all the people who support this ministry uh, in their prayer, through their prayers and finances. Uh, may God bless you and may you go forth in the mighty name of Jesus uh, to share his good news with others. Thank you.